Good evening, everybody, and welcome all of you to live program number 138 at Osbury Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Professor Joseph M. Tweely from Dublin, Ireland. Professor Joseph Tweely is a specialist in hip and knee surgery with a specialist interest in pelvic and acetabular and trauma and joint replacement. He's an associate professor in orthopedic surgery at the Trinity College, Dublin. He trained on the Irish Surgical Training Program in Trauma and Orthopedic Surgery and completed his fellowship training at Cambridge in 2015. He was subsequently appointed as consultant at the Addenbrooke Hospital and was at the Department of Health Trauma at the time of his return to consultant posts in Ireland, St. James and the Beacon Hospitals in Dublin. He has extensive research interests that mirror his clinical interests and has published widely in the fields of trauma and joint replacement with over 40 publications in leading journals like the BMJ and the Cochrane Reviews. He's currently an NIHR grant holder for a large multi-center trial initiating the role of total hip replacement in acetabular fractures, the ACE fit trial. Today, it's my great honor to introduce you to Professor Joseph Peely, Tablet. Over to you, Joe. That's great, uh, Hitesh. Uh, thank you for the kind uh, introduction and also thank you for the invitation to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to give this talk. So uh, as Hitesh says, my interest is, uh, one of my interests is pelvic acetabular trauma. And this talk is about what to, what to do in terms of the initial management of, uh, of pelvic fractures. And I, I, I'm gonna spend about 20 minutes uh, just going through a basic process of how to think about uh, how, how best to manage these injuries and how to get out of trouble and how to do the best uh, uh, for the patient in terms of uh, outcomes. So this is, this is a, a, it's a typical, you know, uh, pelvic major pelvic trauma case, an open book uh, pelvic fracture. This would be uh, an APC type three with a possible vertical shear uh, element. And uh, so, if if you are called out, if you're a part of a trauma team uh, managing this uh, a patient, it's of, it, it's of, often quite daunting and uh, panic inducing. And uh, I guess, you know, the way that we need to look at it is, so what is the main problem here? What's, you know, what's the first thing we should think of? So in an injury like this, really, the first thing we think about is the first problem is mortality, and that that the patient might die from uh, might die from a, a hemorrhage. Uh, it's also very important to be aware of uh, morbidity uh, and and uh, the extensive potential associated soft tissue injuries from uh, you know associated with this type of uh, pelvic injury. So these are the two basic. It is the two basic uh, problems with this with, with pelvic trauma and how we manage this should be framed or the strategy that we use should be uh, framed around dealing with two with, with these two major uh, problems so the initial management first step is don't panic the second uh, step is is dealing with the first problem which is mortality uh, and preventing mortality and it, that, this really comes down to uh, hemorrhage uh, uh, control the second stage then is preventing morbidity, and uh, uh, it's it's uh, uh, almost as important that there's early uh, recognition and management of soft tissue problems such as urological injuries, neurological injuries, uh, recognizing an open fracture, and, uh, uh, and it's not it's, it's not just enough to save the patient's life. You also have to do a good job in uh, in detecting uh, associated uh, injuries as early as possible. To ensure best possible uh, uh, outcomes. Uh, in terms of mortality for in, in uh, pelvic trauma, there's a five percent mortality rate in pelvic fractures. The uh, predictors of same are it, it, it tends to be in older patients, age greater than sixty. Uh, if to have a systolic a systolic blood pressure less than ninety on arrival, if to have severely displaced fractures, particularly uh, uh, displaced uh, uh, fractures involving the posterior uh, pelvic ring such as APC uh, three fractures or vertical shear fractures, uh, and if they have a transfusion requirement greater than four uh, units. It's also important to remember that 50% of severe pelvic fractures will have sig significant uh, uh, bleeding uh, uh, outside of their uh, pelvis. So if, these, if the patient is, is, uh, is hitting these markers or criteria, then, then you need to get worried and you need to start managing uh, 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 the uh, uh, hemorrhage uh, so these, so these are the typical fracture uh, uh, patterns that are associated with, with mortality and pelvic trauma. This, uh, on the left here, we have an APC3 type 
uh, fracture where there is an open book injury at the front and di bilateral disruption of the sacroiliac joints with posterior uh, ligament disruption uh, at the back. Uh, and on the right, then we have a vertical shear fracture of where, where the right uh, hem uh, hemipelvis is migrating uh, approximately. It's also uh, to be aware, it's not just displaced fractures. You can get significant and severe bleeding uh, uh, in non or, non or minimally displaced fractures, such as pubic uh, uh, rami fractures. This is unusual, but it does happen. And it tends to happen often in older patients where a small uh, superior pubic ramus fracture can result in catastrophic bleeding from a corona mortis uh, uh, injury or from an obturator artery uh, uh, injury. And the, the evidence is littered with, with examples of, uh, of, uh, of severe bleeding even from uh, minimally displaced uh, uh, fractures. So the two, in terms of the approach, there's two phases. So the first is, is preventing mortality, uh, and, the, uh, and the second is preventing morbidity. So preventing mortality, it's all about stabilizing the patient and going through the ATLS protocol. So I'm not going to talk too much about the ATLS uh, program. That's for a different, that's for a, a, a different, uh, different session. But the, uh, for pelvic trauma associated bleeding, the way to think about it is three simple steps. Close uh, the uh, pelvic space, uh, fill or replace with uh, uh, typically with blood uh, products, and then find the source of uh, uh, bleeding and switch it off. So it's this process of close, fill, uh, and find. Uh, so step one is closing the pelvic space, and this is to pr provide initial uh, pelvic stability. And the mainstay uh, here is the pelvic binder. And this is the standard, and this should always be put on whenever a pelvic injury is uh, is suspected. Uh, uh, initial pelvic stability can all, also be provided by an external fixator. I would have to say this is rarely uh, required. It's sometimes seen in the setting of open book fractures uh, or uh, post uh, uh, damage control laparotomy, uh, uh, where packing is required, and the external fixator needs to be put on before the packing is. Uh, is uh, is carried out. Traction is sometimes uh, is sometimes useful uh, if there's a, a vertical shear injury. So if there's significant shortening of one limb, then uh, uh, traction can be used along with the pelvic binder to reduce the hemi pelvis and try and uh, uh, control the bleeding. A C clamp is a, a device which is used uh, in some centres. Uh, 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 personally, uh, I'm not a huge fan. I, I think it can be useful for some severe uh, posterior uh, pelvic ring uh, injuries, uh, but uh, it's we'll talk a little uh, a bit about it in a, uh, in a minute. So the binder really is the mainstay, and it's a life-saving device, and this is what everybody should be able to uh, put on from pre-hospital care, from uh, emergency care technicians to uh, to doctors to uh, to uh, trauma uh, nursing staff, and it works by stabilizing the pelvis via circumferential uh, uh, compression. This creates a tamponade effect, and it reduces the pelvic volume and the space to which into which bleeding can uh, can occur. This is a good demonstration here of a of a of a you know of a bad open book fracture, which has been almost perfectly reduced by a uh, by a binder. How do we uh, how do we apply a binder? Uh, so a binder must be applied at the level of the greater trochanters, not the iliac wing. Uh, you, there's a number of commercially available binders, or there is simple, or you can use a simple sheet uh, if there's no uh, binder available. And you can consider intern, internally rotating the lower limbs and tying a sheet around the knees in the in the uh, pre-hospital uh, setting to provide uh, uh, extra uh, uh, stability. So it's really important to apply the binder around the greater trochanters and not more proximally around the uh, the uh, iliac uh, crest. So uh, there's a lot of debate about how long should we leave a binder on for. Uh, so it generally, it should be left on until the patient is uh, stable. Uh, it's, we should try to remove it after six hours uh, if the patient is stable. Uh, when you take a binder off, you need to uh, monitor their blood pressure and heart rate uh, because they may quickly become, become unstable if they're relying on the binder for hemodynamic uh, instability. Uh, if they're if after six hours, uh, if they're still unstable, or if you take the binder off and they become unstable, then immediately replace the uh, binder. And it's, it's okay to leave the binder on uh, uh, indefinitely. Uh, 
you know, for 24 uh, or even 48 hours. Uh, but you must carry out, in this case, you must carry out uh, skin check, skin checks and make sure that there's no areas being uh, 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 compromised from the, uh, from the uh, pressure of the binder. It's important not to over compress. Uh, a lot of patients arrive into the emergency department with binders in, uh, in you know, really almost, almost in over compression. Uh, and you can, you know, if you're putting a binder back on, you can pad pressure areas such as the, uh, the iliac uh, crest. And again, it's important that these are checked uh, every uh, six hours. The, the binder can be loosened very slightly to allow uh, skin uh, 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 inspection. So it's really important that if you are leaving your binder on, if a patient is hemodynamically unstable, that you do a skin check uh, uh, every six hours to make sure that their skin is, that there's no uh, uh, pressure sores uh, developing. What about external fixation? So this is was probably traditionally more the more popular uh, method for trying to achieve uh, uh, initial uh, uh, pelvic stability. Uh, the the uh, current uh, consensus really would be that it's rarely required, as the uh, pelvic uh, binder achieves the same function and is much easier uh, to uh, to put on. Where an external fixation uh, fixator may be useful is if there's an extremely unstable, unstable pelvis, such as some APC3 type uh, fractures, uh, if a patient has had a damage uh, control laparotomy or packing, uh, or if for patients who have uh, uh, open uh, uh, fractures. How do we put an external fixator on? Uh, there's, there's two basic options, the iliac wing, which is the easiest and the quickest. Uh, the second option uh, is supraacetabular pins. Where uh, pins are placed in a supraacetabular uh, uh, corridor, uh, which starts at the anterior inferior iliac spine and runs uh, back towards the sciatic uh, uh, buttress over the greater uh, sciatic notch. This is more stable than the iliac wing. Uh, it, it provides more posterior pelvic stability uh, in particular. However, it, it is uh, technically more difficult uh, to, uh, to, uh, to place. Uh, and when you're putting a binder or the, the external fixator on, make sure that the uh, anterior bars are placed in such a position that the, the patient can uh, can sit up and can be uh, uh, nursed uh, uh, easily. So what about the uh, another option for uh, achieving pelvic stability, the C-clamp? Uh, again, uh, some, some centers use this uh, 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 routinely. Uh, I, uh, I am not, I'm not a frequent user. Uh, it may be useful for some uh, uh, severe posterior injuries, where there's a dislocated uh, sacroiliac joint or vertical shear fractures that remain unstable despite uh, uh, placing a binder. It is really good at, at providing posterior stability. Uh, however, it's not easy to apply. Uh, uh, it's there is a, a significant uh, complication risk in terms of nerve, sacral nerve uh, injuries if, if, the, uh, if the screws are placed in the, wrong, uh, in the wrong position. So that's the first part of the initial management of pelvic uh, uh, trauma is closed down the pelvis, typically with a, uh, with a binder. So once you've provided pelvic stability, the next phase is fill. Uh, and this involves giving the patient one gram of tranexamic acid and then depending on your local uh, your local trauma center major blood transfusion protocol uh, 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 you'll start giving them the necessary uh, blood transfusion depending on the on the uh, criteria so once they have uh, their massive blood transfusion protocol is in place then the next step is we need to find the bleeding uh, uh, as quickly as possible uh, and turn it off if patients, in general, if patients are stable, the best way to find bleed, uh, bleeding is a CT scan of uh, a trauma CT scan from uh, head down to pelvis, and that will identify quickly uh, uh, multiple different uh, potential sources of, of bleeding, both in their pelvis, their abdomen, uh, and, and, and in their uh, chest. If patients are unstable, so if they come in in uh, extremis, uh, so they're exsanguinating, uh, and they're not stable enough for CT, then a damage control laparotomy is, a, is the uh, next step. Or if they're, if they're a poor initial uh, responder to resuscitation and uh, may not be suitable for, uh, for, uh, for CT or for embolization, then again, a, a damage control lapar laparotomy is the, uh, is the next step. Uh, 
this is just a, a, an algorithm uh, uh, about how to uh, about how to think about managing these uh, these patients in terms of finding a source of bleeding. So if patients uh, are uh, exsanguinating and if they have a positive fast uh, ultrasound scan for uh, for uh, for abdominal uh, abdominal pelvic bleeding, uh, or if they're a poor responder to the initial uh, massive blood transfusion. Then they're not really suitable to go for a CT, angio, or and embolization. They need to go straight for a laparotomy uh, uh, and uh, direct control of the bleeding, be it abdominal bleeding or pelvic bleeding, placement of an external fixator, and uh, and pelvic uh, pelvic packing. Uh, if if patients uh, the second arm, if patients uh, respond um, uh, uh, or transiently uh, uh, respond to resuscitation. Then the uh, next step is, 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 as I said, is to get a CT of their uh, abdomen, pelvis, and thorax. This will quickly identify uh, the uh, bleeding, and it will tell us if the bleeding is uh, amenable to em embolization uh, or not. Uh, and this, you know, this could be pelvic bleeding or it could be abdominal bleeding, uh, uh, etc. If if it's if it's amenable to embolization, then uh, patients could go to interventional radiology, which ideally should be uh, uh, very close to your your uh, emergency department uh, and your trauma ICU. If it's not something that, uh, 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 that can be managed with embolization, then we need to go back to the damage control uh, laparotomy option, external fixation and, uh, and packing. So where in terms of uh, mortality from uh, pelvic uh, trauma uh, hemorrhage, so 80% of pelvic uh, uh, bleeding in pelvic trauma comes from, uh, is venous in, in uh, origin, and it comes from the presacral uh, venous plexus. 20% is arterial, uh, and the majority of this generally is, comes from, or, or common sources are the uh, internal iliac uh, superior gluteal artery, where it hooks around the uh, greater, sciatic, greater sciatic notch here, the uh, obturator, uh, obturator artery, which is over the obturator uh, foramen here, uh, or the uh, the uh, corona mortis, which is uh, just above the superior pubic uh, ramus. Uh, what about embolization in, in pelvic trauma? It's the liter literature reports success rates of 85 to 90 percent. Uh, it it works well for arterial bleeding, but not so well for venous bleeding. Uh, approximately 10 percent of all pelvic fractures require embolization. And in terms of timing, so timing is really important. For it to be successful, ideally, it should be within uh, 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 three hours uh, of arrival in the uh, in the emergency department. So that's why you should have you know 24 hour on call interventional uh, trauma uh, 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 ready uh, interventional uh, trauma uh, radiology uh, service uh, that is beside the emergency uh, department for uh, easy uh, easy access. If it's within, th within uh, three hours, it's a 36.4% uh, mortality versus 75% mortality in, in one study if it's, it's, if it's uh, greater than three hours. So what about pelvic packing? Uh, where, does it, where does that come in? This is, this is really very rarely uh, required. If, if, uh, if you have a good embolization uh, service and protocol, uh, the times uh, as to wh uh, when it is required is if patients uh, are unstable after embolization, uh, despite you know uh, the binder and embolization, if it's unstable venous bleeding, where uh, again embolization is not uh, is not suitable, uh, or again uh, the category of uh, patients who come in in extremis who are uh, exsanguinating and go straight uh, go straight to uh, theater for a damage control uh, uh, laparotomy. Uh, the pelvic packing can be done via stop approach or via a, a laparotomy. Uh, and, there's, and there's three basic places to place to place the large uh, to place the, the large gauze uh, packs. So one is in the presacral area, which is donated here, and that's to stop the venous bleeding from the uh, presacral venous plexus. The second is over the greater sciatic notch, and this is specifically aimed at the uh, superior uh, uh, gluteal uh, artery. And the third place is over the obturator foramen and the superior uh, pubic uh, ramus. Again, this is uh, aiming at the uh, corona uh, uh, mortis, and there should be three packs on uh, on uh, on either side. Uh, and that you know that brings us to the end of of managing uh, the uh, hemorrhage. So again, just to just to summarise, it's all about uh, closing the, uh, and providing pelvic stability, uh, filling, 
uh, with with massive blood transfusion and and then finding the bleeding as quickly as possible and uh, and uh, switching it off. So that's in general it saves the uh, saves the patients' uh, uh, lives. Uh, the next stage then is is to uh, quickly move on move on to a complete and thorough assessment. Uh, of all the potential injuries associated with the pelvic fracture. And uh, these start with examination of the skin, then uh, uh, the urological tract and uh, neurovascular uh, uh, examination. So it's really important uh, to uh, document the state of, uh, of skin uh, and whether there's an open fracture present or not. Some uh, pelvic, open pelvic fractures are quite obvious uh, as depicted here on the right hand side. Other uh, open pelvic fractures may not be that obvious. So there may be a small wound in the perineum that may be missed. And it may be, you know, if you don't look for it carefully, it may be diagnosed a week later. And the patient may, you know, may at this stage may have gone on to develop deep uh, 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 pelvic infection, which is a very difficult problem to, uh, to resolve. So you must, you must inspect the skin area circumferentially, uh, uh, including the perineum. If there's any question of a rectal injury, if there's any PR bleeding, for example, you must do a PR and you must get the general surgeons involved uh, uh, early. Uh, and they may do a proctoscopy uh, uh, if they're suspicious of a, uh, of a rectal injury. Again, if there's any vaginal injury, uh, if there's any suggestion of vaginal injury, such as PV bleeding, you, you need to get the, the uh, obstetric uh, uh, team involved uh, uh, straight away and they will decide uh, whether or not a speculum, a speculum examination uh, is required. Uh, it's really important not to miss an open pelvic fracture which, uh, as mortality is reported up to uh, 50%. You need to start uh, IV antibiotics, tetanus, uh, and then move to uh, early debridement uh, um, in a specialist uh, pelvic trauma center. So that's open uh, skin problems. Another uh, 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 soft uh, tissue problem that's commonly missed early in uh, pelvic trauma is the Morella Valle uh, lesions. And this is a degloving injury uh, between the skin and the subcutaneous uh, uh, tissue separates from the uh, fascia. So this space opens up between the uh, fascia and the skin. It's easy to uh, miss because as the skin is closed and it can just look like uh, bruising. But this is a, it can be a big problem and it can result in significant morbidity and it's also a significant uh, infection risk. And, and the, uh, the way to diagnose it is just bruising and uh, fluctuance. And if you have any doubt, then you need to get further imaging in the form of ultrasound or a, a, or a MRI scan. Uh, these need aggressive uh, treatment early in terms of debridement. Uh, they, they require a, a VAC addressing and it's all, always proven to involve the uh, plastics team when managing these uh, uh, difficult uh, uh, injuries. So moving on to potential neurological injury. Uh, so if there's any suspicion of urological injury such as uh, blood at the urethral meatus, uh, high riding prostrate, uh, uh, hematuria, you need to call urology and arrange uh, imaging. Uh, it's uh, a single attempt at passing a a 16 gauge catheter is recommended by the BOST uh, uh, pelvic trauma guidelines. If, if, if successful and still suspicious of injury, then, then urological tract imaging is required. This can be a retrograde cystogram or the gold uh, uh, standard really is a CT uh, cystogram. If, uh, if, if you are unsuccessful in, in uh, pa uh, passing a catheter, then uh, the urology uh, uh, service need to be need to be uh, involved and they need to place a suprapubic catheter uh, out, ideally out of the zone of a future stop uh, incision that you may use for uh, for uh, for pelvic fracture uh, uh, fixation and ide ideally they should use ultrasound uh, when placing the suprapubic uh, uh, catheter uh, this is just a demonstration of how to do a retrograde urethrogram where a, a catheter uh, tip is placed in the uh, meatus the balloon is, is inflated uh, very slightly and contrast is passed. Uh, and on the right is an example of a retrograde cystogram demonstrating a, uh, a bladder, uh, a bladder a neck of bladder uh, injury. So then looking at, uh, looking at neurological uh, injury, again, it's really important at the outset to document any uh, neurological uh, deficit. In particular, the L5 nerve root is vulnerable as it passes over the uh, sacral uh, ala. Sacral nerve roots are also obviously vulnerable in sacral fractures. Uh, 
and the uh, lateral femoral cutaneous nerve is vu vulnerable at the front of the uh, uh, pelvis near the anterior superior uh, iliac spine. So, in summary, when faced with a uh, with a, a daunting and potentially catastrophic injury like this, uh, don't panic. Think, close, fill, and find. Uh, close the pelvis, start replacing with, uh, with blood products uh, and then find the bleeding as quickly as possible uh, and, uh, and, uh, and switch it off. Uh, once the patient's life has been saved, then we need to uh, uh, move on and do a, a thorough, complete assessment of all the, uh, the soft tissue structures uh, that may be injured. So start at the outside looking at the skin. It's really important to examine the uh, 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 vagina, the rectum, uh, the scrotum. Uh, it's be mindful of your neurological tract injury and document any uh, neurovascular uh, uh, injuries. These are these are often complex injuries, and uh, you know if you have any doubt, uh, get the other specialties involved from the very beginning. So the the, 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 uh, the uh, relevant specialties are interventional radiologists, general surgeons, urologists, uh, plastic surgeons, and uh, obstetrics and uh, gynae. It's really important that they're involved at the very beginning, even in the emergency department, as it's not much use calling uh, calling somebody uh, two weeks uh, down the line to have a rectal injury. It's a very different problem to uh, a very different problem to uh, to manage. So that's the end of the uh, that's the end of my uh, talk. I just leave this uh, this summary slide up here, which which essentially su su summarizes the the uh, the to talk about dividing it up into stabilizing and then assessing the soft tissue structures. And uh, so if there's any questions, uh, Hitesh, you might uh, facilitate. Thank you. Thank you, Joe, for a fantastic presentation on the initial management of pelvic fractures. You've covered almost the entire gamut of uh, options that are available. Uh, a few questions. Yep. Uh, are there any contraindications for using a pelvic binder? Uh, yes, yeah, so I, I, I can't think of any contraindications, really. The only one that could be, you know, the only one that could be a potential difficulty is if the patient has a dislocated hip. But, you know, you're not going to really know that, you know, the time to put a, 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 a pelvic binder on is when there's any suspicion of a pelvic injury. You're not really going to know if, uh, if a patient has a dislocated hip or not at that point. You want to have imaging. So, in general, there's, you know, there's no real contraindications. Even with an open pelvic fracture in a pre-hospital setting, uh, uh, you know, binder is a life-saving, life-saving device, and it should be, uh, it should be put on. Thank you for that. The other thing is uh, the pelvic C clamp. Do you use it? You use the pelvic C clamp in your practice? I don't. So we, uh, uh, so we had one, or we have one, but we uh, never, very rarely use it. Uh, uh, so, and, and, I, and I would have to say the trend over the past. I would say five to 10 years has been moving away even from using an external fixator. Uh, as I said, pelvic binders do uh, much do the same job as an external fi fixator for the majority of pelvic fractures. So I would say even the amount of times I've had to put an external fixator on is, is, uh, is you know, is, is, is decreasing, not to, men not to mention using a C-clamp, which, uh, which I almost never use really. And also the C-clamp has more unique complications, right? Because I've gone through some of the complications, a small intestinal perforation is one of the complications. So that is ridiculous. It's dangerous, isn't it? It is. It is. So, it, it, you know, people people who use it and who are trained in it, it is like it, it, it does work. But those pins at the back are very sharp and they're, uh, they can end up in all sorts of places. Uh, nerve injury in particular is a problem. And, uh, you know, um, I wouldn't, uh, you know, for me, for me, it's you know, it's uh, I, I I would say I almost never use it. The other one is uh, regarding the indications for a pelvic packing. So we, we, yeah. you have options when you have an unstable pelvis. The patient is also unstable, and you have the option of giving an embolization or a pelvic packing. Now you have a you do embolization when there's a documented arterial bleeding, isn't it? So what are the indications General, for yeah. a pelvic packing? So pelvic, yeah, so there's, again, there's a bit of a divide in the uh, pelvic trauma community about, so different major trauma centers have different protocols about whether to use pelvic pa packing as a primary, you know, as a primary step in trying to uh, uh, find and control the bleeding. 
uh, I think, uh, and other centres are, are are more pro embolization. Uh, I think you know. I think if you have a good embolization service, if you can get a, a patient into an interventional radiology suite within three hours of arriving in the emergency department, and they have arterial bleeding, I think that you know that is definitely the way to go, and there's good evidence to support that. Difficulty is is that the majority of pelvic bleeding is uh, is venous, so it's a bit counterintuitive to say, okay, well. You know, you know, you know, switching off the arterial bleeding, but sometimes switching off the arterial bleeding can have a have an effect on the consequent venous bleeding. Uh, you know, but again, you know, if it, if that doesn't work, you know, if the patient remains unstable with uh, with uh, after embolization, then you can always go back to uh, to pelvic packing. Pelvic packing is, is a fairly aggressive procedure. And it, you know, it, it is again, there's reason reasonable morbidity uh, associated with that. So again. You know, at least in the centres I've worked in, the trend has been to move away from uh, from pelvic packing and more uh, and more towards uh, embolization. But you must have a good embolization service to uh, you know to provide uh, uh, safe and effective uh, um, uh, you know uh, uh, hemorrhage control. The other one is when do you normally once you've done a pelvic packing, when do you normally remove these packs? Uh, so it's 24, 48 hours. Uh, and uh, is uh, in general, but often patients will have they'll often have, you know they'll have a laparotomy for you know for other reasons. I think the most common reason now you know for for me for pelvic packing is, is if a patient has a damage control laparotomy for abdominal bleeding, uh, and they need uh, uh, you know they need uh, the uh, pelvic bleeding stopped as well, uh, and that's that's probably the, the most common uh, the most common indication. Thank you for that. The other question is regarding the bleeding. Uh, when you said the rectal bleeding, uh, can we consider it as an open fracture if you see rectal bleeding or if you have fragments in the rectum? So what does it really say that it's an open pelvic fracture? Yeah. So if you got if if you got a rectal injury, uh, if you you know if you have a rectal injury from you know from you know either from the fragments or just from a soft tissue injury, it still you know it still has to it has to be considered to be to be an open, uh, uh, to be you know, to be an open injury, these patients often need uh, often need a diverting colostomy, and uh, you know, and that needs to be done early. There's no point, as I said, there's no point, you know, uh, uh, you know, finding this out a week or ten days uh, after the injury. So that's why, if you're concerned at all all about uh, a, a, a rectal injury, get the general surgery uh, 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 expert in to the emergency department. And, and tell them of your concerns. And often, if a patient is, is having, you know, for example, an X-fix put on, then, then they can come and do a proctoscopy and confirm one way or the other uh, whether there's, uh, a, a, you know, a rectal, um, a rectal injury. It's very unusual, but it's, it's something that can be have catastrophic consequences if it's uh, if it's missed. Thank you for that, Joe. Before we wind up, one last question. Uh, sure. See, you've shown a picture of a moral level lesion. So there yeah. are some surgeons, for example, Paul Tonetta described a percutaneous technique where you uh, treat these uh, moral lavalies. So how do you really approach? Do you open it or can you treat it percutaneously? Uh, so it can be. So my opinion on moral lavalie, I treat them as open injuries. Uh, again, in the setting of uh, of kind of major trauma, they tend to be, you know, really severe uh, uh, soft tissue injuries. Uh, I would. Uh, advise that you uh, involve plastic surgery colleagues early, uh, and 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 uh, and generous debridement and uh, and vac dressing. I, I'm not sure in, in the setting of major trauma if if uh, if uh, endoscopic or percutaneous works really. To be honest, I think it it may work if you have an isolated uh, morel levelle. It's just an isolated soft tissue injury. Soft tissue injury, for example, after. After relatively minor trauma, and there's no fractures associated, and the patient has a morale of LA lesion that's been stable and has been around maybe for for a few weeks or a month, and they present. It, it may be easier uh, to manage those with endoscopic approach, but my uh, my uh, personal preference in the setting of major trauma is is uh, is open debridement. So that's all the questions that we have. Thank you for a fantastic session and we really learned a lot from your wonderful lecture. It's been a very enlightening moment. Thank you once again for joining us and we really, really look forward for another one later on whenever we have time.
Okay, lovely. Thanks, uh, thanks everyone. Okay, I like the session.